Hi everyone, it is Dr. Keenan. It's Wednesday, March the 3rd, and I'm so happy to be here with you all this afternoon. I'm coming to you from my cell phone from the office, so I'm hoping that you can all see me just fine. Um, I'm just gonna just share this. Okay. All right, so I um, nice to see you, Jamie, and anybody else that's out there as well. So I'm gonna do my best to answer questions from the screen, but actually I wanna to start today with a scenario. So um, welcome to a question and answer session. And so one of the two scenarios came over the past couple of weeks and I wanted to use these as examples uh, to kind of lead us into the introduction about what to do uh, for weight loss over 40. So one question came to me, okay. So I've been following a ketogenic diet. Uh, I started two years ago and I lost 98 pounds, which is incredible. Uh, but this past summer, my dad passed away and I fell off the wagon with keto and I gained half my weight back. So this individual lost 100 pounds and gained back 50 pounds since the summer. And now she's saying, it's so much harder to lose. Why, what's going wrong? What can I do? So a few things come from this scenario. So number one is I'm not sure how old this individual is, but I'm guessing um, that age may have something to do with it. So that's the first thing that I would ask is what is this individual's age? And so the person did really well two years ago. It sounds like a ketogenic diet looked very well. And 100 pounds is wonderful. That is a great success on a ketogenic diet. Really, that's a life transformation to happen. So, so happy for you that you were able to make those changes. So then what went wrong? What's happening now? So one of the things that could be happening now is that you're two years older. Okay, so what happens when you're two years older? So 40 to 42, let's say we go from this scenario. Well, guess what, ladies? I hate to tell you this, but perimenopause actually begins at 40. And actually for some women, even into their late 30s. So many of us hear about menopause. And we kind of think about menopause as hot flashes. Um, but what menopause is defined as is menopause is actually when your period has stopped for one year, okay? But as soon as, but we're most of us now are in that perimenopause range. So from our late 30s up until about 52, which 52 is the average when people will actually go into menopause. So, so number one, this is what could be happening. That the person now is two years older, has gone from 40 to 42, and the hormones are beginning to shift. Okay? So when your hormones begin to shift, then things can become more complicated with us. So I'll begin this by asking then, talking a little bit about hormones. So um, number one, many people are still on some type of birth control pill. And, you know, years ago when I was an early physician, I would have said, you know, go on a birth control pill when you're young, get your cycles regulated, stay on it right up until the time of menopause, and then just come off of it. But over the information I've learned over the past couple of years, I would say that's not wise. Number one, when we're putting... Um, external hormones into our system in the form of birth control pills, these are estrogens and progesterones that are not familiar to our body. They are not normal. They're synthetically created. So these estrogens and progesterones can actually throw our bodies out of balance. Okay, especially, number one, when young girls start on them, this is not normal for them. And then as we go through these hormonal changes, um, these External hormones can make it much harder actually for us to control our natural cycles that are going to be going on. One of the things that can come from these external hormones, let's call them the birth control pill, okay? So one thing that can happen is some of these birth control pills can act more like an androgen, okay? So I want you to learn what an androgen is. So androgen, think about it as the male hormone, more of like a testosterone-based hormone. So what do we like about men? Men can bulk up, they get strong, big muscles, okay? And it's testosterone that promotes that in a man, okay? Think of the opposite in a man. When you see a man that's overweight, what do you see? You see a man start to get a big belly and then man boobs happen, 
right? So that man has actually developed more of estrogen type side effects. When we go on something like the birth control pill, for many women, it can actually stimulate more of the male hormones or the androgens. So it can cause women to put on weight. It can cause them to get thick around their middle. It can cause them to get bigger around their top, you know, around their shoulders. It can put that thickness on around the thighs. So that can be hormonally mediated by the birth control pill. So that's the first thing I would ask in that question. So why am I having more trouble? The trouble can be because you've aged, your hormones are changing, and maybe you are still on some type of external birth control pill. So say you're not on an external birth control pill. So what else can be happening? So let's call it, per so perimenopause, we have estrogen and progesterone that are changing and also testosterone. So these are three hormones, ladies and men, that you have to learn about. Estrogen, um, progesterone, testosterone, okay? So when we go through perimenopausal years, what happens is estrogen is like we're on a roller coaster. So estrogen is going high and it's going low, and it's going high and it's going low. So think about it when you're a little bit younger, maybe, and you're going through PMS. So many of you might have noticed that when you go through your cycle, that there can be a time that you are the most grumpy, contrary person, <laughs> you know, a week or so before your periods, okay? That's because estrogen is starting to spike in your system and maybe you're not so good to get along with. But then what happens? Your period comes, your estrogen and progesterone, they both drop, and then you're a much more pleasant person. Well, guess what? When you're in your perimenopause years, estrogen is doing this all the time. It's ebbing and flowing. It's you're on a constant roller coaster ride. And when that happens, you can have mood swings. You can be grumpy. You can be more anxious. You can be more snipey. Uh, snippy, sorry. You know, you're not getting along with people. You're just grouchy. You're not feeling yourself. Um, you know, you might find that you're having more brain fog, that you can't be more clear in your thoughts, that you're not getting things done. And this is related to these hormones being out of balance. So one of them is estrogen and the way that estrogen is starting to fluctuate. The other hormone I want you to know about is progesterone. So progesterone is the feel-good hormone. And for many women, you know it because when you were pregnant, you had a nice, healthy glow. You know, even though you had the big belly, you felt wonderful and you felt good in your body. It was like a sense of satisfaction. So what happens as we go into perimenopause, progesterone is slowly going down. It generally doesn't fluctuate like the estrogen's roller coaster, but it's on a slow decline, okay? And then testosterone is our third hormone. And testosterone, like I just said, it's kind of our male dominant hormone. And generally, it's going to be declining somewhat. But the de then depending on your other hormones, what kind of balance they're in, for some women, as they go through perimenopause and into menopause, testosterone levels can actually rise. So think about it. So um, a rising testosterone can get you to that point that you're going to be laying down more weight. And that can be a reason that you struggle to lose more, even though you were doing the same dietary plan that you were on before, because your hormones have shifted. Now, for some women, when they're going through perimenopause, testosterone will decrease. When it does, those women are going to see that um, they're going to have low libido, low sex drive. You know, that starts to, to go off. For some women, they may actually start to lose muscle mass, and that can be because their testosterone is declining. So those key three hormones are changes that can be going on that can really influence what's happening, whether you're on a ketogenic diet. So then for those three hormones, what can you do? Uh, for many individuals, you may need to have a hormone evaluation. Um, in the context of a full lifestyle evaluation, okay? 
Some women will come to me and they'll say, Dr. Keenan, I just want hormone replacement. I want to be on some estrogen or progesterone. You know, can, give, can you give me some topicals? Can you put me on something? Um, but I don't think that's the greatest way to do it without looking at some of our other hormones in the whole entire context. Because we know that we have to get at the root for weight loss. We have to get at the root for health. So even more important than your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone can be thyroid, okay? Um, Promensal, safe Promensal is a, uh, it's a natural su supplement, kind of more of a soy-based. It can be safe for many women, yes, Wendy. Uh, and again, it, you have to look at the whole context of why you're taking it and other things that are going on. If it works for you, then that's great. Um, but the other hormone I want you to think about is thyroid. So when women are going through these perimenopausal changes, thyroid can also become out of balance. And we see a lot of women get into thyroid problems when they're 40 plus, okay? And that's the influence of fluctuating estrogen, lowering progesterone, and also the role of cortisone or cortisol. Because many women, the 40 plus years are a very stressful time. You've got kids that are graduating university or maybe they're graduating just high school. Maybe your parents are getting older, you have to take care of your parents. And all that cortisol can have a big impact on your thyroid. When thyroid is out of balance, then go figure trying to get your weight in balance. You know, I have a patient recently, uh, she was diagnosed with thyroid disease, I think it's about three or four, three years ago now. So we started her on thyroid uh, replacement. Um, she noticed a little bit of a change with her weight. Then I got her to eliminate gluten. She definitely noticed uh, an improvement. And then I got her to actually supplement with just a few extra um, vitamins like iodine and selenium. And then she started to notice that her weight was really starting to bounce to come off but she's in the 40 plus category. So it's very much a time of life when women can start to go uh, have problems. So this is another thing to think about, I would say. So we talk the, the female hormones, but think about your thyroid hormone. And so often I'll tell women, go see your doctor and they'll go there and they'll get what's called a TSH. So a TSH is your thyroid stimulating hormone. And it's just the basic hormone to have done. But for many women, you can have imbalances of T3 and T4, and those are the active thyroid hormones that are in your body. And when those are out of balance, then again, it can give us a bigger picture that maybe you need thyroid replacement or maybe you need tweaking of something else in your diet. The other thing that I will often get women to ask for if they're going to have this test is anti-thyroid antibodies. And especially if they've had a family history of thyroid disorder. Because for many individuals, you will your thyroid can be slightly out of balance. And sometimes we can tweak this, tweak this through food changes or through stress changes. But you can actually make antibodies against your thyroid. And you can have a genetic predisposition to that. So if I do blood work and I see that the thyroid antibodies are high, then that triggers a whole other cascade of how we're going to help those women to start to get their thyroid in balance and then subsequently get their weight in balance. Um, and then the third along those lines of hormones would be the cortisol, okay? So cortisol is something that you can measure. So, you know, many endocrinologists will measure a cortisol level. They'll do a cortisol level first thing in the morning, and then they'll do one in the afternoon. So cortisol, remember, is our stress hormone. It's our fight or flight hormone. And what you should see that all of us, our cortisone is generally a little bit higher in the morning, and it's going to decrease in the afternoon. And that's a normal response. Because when we wake up, our body needs to stimulate itself, so it needs a little bit of stress to get ourselves going through the day. And then as we go down through the day, that cortisol level will be low. Um, but what can happen for some individuals, uh, women and men, if you've suffered from chronic amount of stress, you basically, your body goes into burnout. And when your body goes into burnout mode, like initially your cortisols will be high, 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 high. And then it's as if your adrenals, which make your cortisone, if they get burnt out, and then you'll start to see that your morning cortisol level is actually low 
and then your afternoon cortisol level is low. So this can be done through a blood test, but ideally if I'm suspecting cortisol, I like to do what's called a four-point saliva test. So the reason for this is that I get four measurements, so it gives me a better curve to see as to what's going on in the body. And also when we do a saliva test, it's a more accurate representation because by the time you go to the hospital to have blood work done twice, number one, you had to go through the COVID screening process, somebody had to stick a needle in your arm, and you had to wait a while. So those factors themselves can raise your cortisol up so they can actually give you a false reading of where your cortisol levels are. So I prefer to do the uh, saliva cortisol test, and generally that is a test that we refer. Um, you know, GPs don't do it, it's not available at hospitals, so it has to be done at a third-party lab. So that's another uh, testing that I would sometimes get done uh, based on a full physical profile to see what's going on with your cortisol level. Because this woman mentioned, that she had the death of her dad, you know, over the summer. And that is so traumatic, you know, for so many, so many reasons, but that amount of stress can raise the cortisol levels. And then cortisol, when it, we are in that mode, makes it much more difficult for us to begin to lose weight. So, so why is that? So why does cortisol influence weight? So think about it, you know, I come back again to remember sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic is stress mode. It is fight or flight, it's run, okay, run away. Our, our parasympathetic is rest and digest and heal our body. So if cortisol is high, we're gonna fight or flight, we're gonna hold on to those pounds, we don't wanna lose them, we wanna keep every calorie in our body because we're scared that we're not gonna have enough energy that we can run away from that tiger. So if you're living in a state of stress, and I'm not sure how the grief reaction has been, you know, because for many people, three to six months following the death of a close family member, like your dad, can be a rough time. So, um, so grief can still be there, and stress can still be there. So that can make it much more difficult to lose weight, even though you were doing all the exact same things that you were doing before. So what do I say is, um, so for this individual, so thanks for sharing your story and um, you need to be easy on yourself right now, okay? Um, if keto still feels good to you, then stick with keto. If you feel you want to change up a little bit, maybe even try something like intermittent fasting. But what I would say is look at what's going on with your stress and then I'd also say look at what's going on in your sleep because your sleep also goes hand in hand. So maybe do you need to talk with somebody about your stress? You know, do you um, need to do some things to nurture your own body? Do you need to go and really um, take some flowers to your dad's grave? You know, do you need to get together with your family and everyone say, let's have a good cry? Um, do you need to go to your family home and help your mom clean out the closet? You know, these are hard things to talk about, but sometimes that's what we need to do is we need to let go of those things so that our body can move forward. We need to go through a healing process so that our body once again can start to feel vibrant so that we can get ourselves in order, okay? So that we can begin to feel uh, what gets back, what gets our body to that state of vitality once again. So I hope that really gives you a little bit of food for thought for the person that put that comment in. And then I want to shift just a little bit um, into another comment that we had in our last 10 minutes or so. So someone was talking a little bit about training. And so they said, you know, they, they were a fitness athlete. They were doing, um, I don't know if it was keto or in an intermittent fasting, and it was working so well for them. But now they find that they're really having a tough time maintaining their muscle mass and also they find that they're actually starting to gain, even though they were doing the same fitness program that they were doing before. So a few of these questions will overlap. So number one, I'm going to say, okay, I'll, let's say this person is 49, okay, or 48. So definitely well into the perimenopausal years. And they're doing a lot of fitness, which it sounds like this person was doing. 
So they're going to the gym. Maybe they're doing 45 minutes on the treadmill or 45 minutes on the cross trainer. And then maybe in the evenings they're going for a run. So this is excellent. You know, this would be wonderful for many, many women. But at 49, okay, you have to think, are you being too hard on your body? When you're too hard on your body, a few things can happen. So one is your body can be actually stressed too much. You can be overloading yourself too much. Because remember, your estrogen and your progesterone, they're all shifting. Your testosterone is shifting. So some women are actually overtraining. When you overtrain, you can sometimes, uh, again, you get cortisol too high. So that when cortisol is high, remember you're in fight or flight and hang on to the calories. You need to lower your cortisol. So you might, I know you won't want to hear this, but you might need to switch to more gentle exercises. Maybe you need to think about yoga, thinking about stretching and flexibility. Maybe thinking about taking that workout to 30 minutes a day instead of to 45 minutes a day. You know, unless you're going to be a marathon athlete, I know that physical fitness can be a, a wonderful thing for mental capacity, but also if it's getting you to the point that you're overtraining, that can be a reason why your weight is not shifting. The other thing I want you to think about is when you're training is again, that you may be raising your testosterone too high. So if you have a background of polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example, PCOS. If you maybe never had PCOS, but you had irregular cycles all your life, if you suffered from infertility, uh, maybe you actually did have a problem with your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And now you're you know, 49 and you're wondering why the weight's not coming off. Perhaps it's because testosterone is an issue for you. So uh, getting your fitness down, actually downgrading your fitness can actually be something that's going to help you a little bit in terms of helping with your weight loss. And then, like I spoke about before, really looking at your hormones, you know, and uh, having a thorough evaluation to see what's going on with your hormones to see if that can help to, uh, to make a difference. Uh, I do want to bring up as well for this individual, um, you know, that's, that's overtraining, you know, some women do it because, again, they're doing it for the mental health benefits, which is wonderful, but you have to think about how you can nurture your body in another way. We need to somehow add an activity there that's going to get us into parasympathetic. It's going to get us into rest and to digest and into heal. So yoga, meditation, going for a walk, going for a hike, treating yourself to a massage on a regular basis, taking a bubble bath when you just read a good book, things like becoming a member of a women's group that's just going out and having fun that's not related to alcohol. Um, maybe it's doing things like chanting. Maybe it's doing things like laughter yoga. Maybe it's uh, doing things like prayer. Maybe it's going to get in touch with like uh, going to church again, a social environment that's getting you out of stress mode into relax mode. Maybe it's shifting things at your workplace. Maybe it's not by gossiping when you go to work. Maybe it's by getting a gratitude journal, by focusing on the positives in your life rather than focusing on the negatives. Maybe it's by turning the news off. Maybe it's not by comparing yourselves and your yourself and your weight to others and people that are around you. I'm just trying to get you to think about shifting your body into feel good mode. Okay, that's what it's about. Because when we're constantly living in stress, and exercise can be that way. Exercise can also benefit us. But if you do it excessively, then you can overcome the good benefits that exercise is having. And you may not be taking care of your own self. You know, we need to nurture our body. We need to feel good in many ways. And we don't always have to go in search of food for those feel good ways as well. So reflect on that for that individual that's overtraining. 
See what's really going on. What's at the core there? What areas of your life do you need to shed a little bit more love on rather than focusing it all on everything that's going on at the gym? Um, and I'm going to do one quick add into the gym, even though I've got honestly like two hours or more notes here on my sheet that I could talk about women's hormones so uh, or women's weight gain. We might have to do this again. But the one thing I'll add about weight and training, okay, and I'll finish off with this one, is that the one thing that will happen for women as we become near, near middle age is that for those that aren't training, as your estrogen, remember it's fluctuating, it's dropping, progesterone's dropping, and also for some women, testosterone drops. So we can actually develop a condition called sarcopenia. That means your loss of your muscle mass. And this happened to me this year, okay? I'm 49, and over the winter, I noticed that my muscles were getting a bit flabby, especially, you know, that little bit at the back of the arm and my buttocks. My butt was just becoming more flabby, and I was starting to see those dimples, and I hated to see that cellulite on my bum. And I said, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, I need to do something. I started exercising. Then, you know, over the summer and then the fall, I moved to Bermuda. I was like, I go for walks on the beach regularly. I could see my body starting to get toned up. And then I joined the gym. Yes, I'm going to CrossFit. I think it's an amazing thing that I needed to do. And then I was reading more about sarcopenia and what's really happening. And this is a true thing that happens here for women. It will happen that... Um, your muscle mass is going to start to go down. So even though you did all the exact same things before, even though you ate all the same stuff, even you did, though you did keto, even though you did intermittent fasting, if your muscles are getting weak, then you're lowering your muscle mass. We need muscle mass to um, raise our metabolic rate so that we can burn calories faster. So for people that are not exercising at all, and saying, why am I stuck? I will say to those of you who is like me, is that you need to do weight bearing exercise. You need to do muscle strengthening exercises, whether that is in the form of CrossFit, but it has to be muscle loading. Going for a walk is not enough. Sorry, ladies, it's just not. Running is not enough. You need to do something that you can strengthen your muscle, okay? It doesn't have to be a lot, but two or three times a week, you have to move your muscle so that by 10 or 15 reps, your muscle is tired and fatigued. So for some of you, that might be 15 push-ups. 15 push-ups, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Start doing it on your knees. Then get up to the point you can do 15 push-ups where you're doing them in full position. Holding yourself in plank. You know, maybe you do it starting for 15 seconds and you build yourself up to a minute but you need to work on muscle strengthening, okay? And hormone panels. So I'll finish, I guess, with this question because um, I guess I didn't ask. So honestly, Carla, the hormone panels that your family doctor is going to do for you really are not sufficient. And many people will come in and they'll go see their doctor and they'll say, oh, doctor, my hormones are out of balance. Do some blood work on me. You know, it's often a waste of healthcare dollars because they're going to measure your LH, FSH, does it really matter? No. If you're having hot flashes and weight gain and you're over 40, you're in perimenopause, just admit it. You don't need the blood work to do it. Um, really having a saliva-based test is a much more, it's a much better reflection of what's going on in your hormones. And most GPs do not do it.